Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for, uh, for joining us for this conference on transnational currents in the Gulf. My name is Augustus Norton, Richard Norton, uh, would be the name that most of you know me by. I want to welcome uh, everyone who has chosen to attend, and particularly our invited speakers and participants, Ali Banuazizi from Boston College, Kristen Smith Diwan from American University, uh, my colleague uh, from International Relations, uh, Charles Dunbar, uh, Nader Habibi from uh, Brandeis University, Nazli Kibiria, also from BU, from the Department of Sociology, uh, Farhad Kazemi from New York University, Farhad Nizami, from Oxford, where he provides me a home when I'm not in Boston, and um, Mesti Semati from Northern Illinois University, uh, my friend John Tierman from MIT, Ibrahim Borde from Tufts University, and Judith Yaffe from the Institute for National Security Studies at the uh, National Defense University in Washington. So thank you, all of you, for coming whether it was across the street, across the river, or particularly if you came by air, and most especially if you had to navigate US um, immigration authorities to come here. Uh, as you know, many of the meetings that take place focusing on the Gulf um, focus uh, in large measure on questions about oil uh, and security, and at this meeting, we're going to focus on neither of these two topics as our primary theme. Instead, the idea of this conference is to focus on, if you will, the tr sort of transnational aspects uh, of the Gulf. Uh, we began uh, this program uh, a year or so ago, thanks to the uh, Pardee Center, which is sponsoring this meeting. Uh, we had a brainstorming session uh, and today we're uh, we're hosting this meeting, uh, thanks to the uh, thanks to the uh, to the sponsorship of the Pardee Center and its director uh, Adil Najam. I think now we can go ahead and get started. So if the first panel would take their places, uh, we'll kick it off as soon as everyone is in place. Thank you so much. Uh, we will begin the first panel, uh, which is focused on the question of money uh, in the Gulf. Um, I would add to what has already been said, first of all, uh, my own uh, great pleasure um, as a participant um, in the conference. Um, and perhaps to point out that in planning the conference, I know that the hope was uh, that this would become uh, a sort of a workshop uh, rather than uh, merely uh, a conference consisting of the presentation of papers. So the discussion, uh, discussions that will uh, follow the panels um, are very much part of uh, the proceedings of the conference. And um, given the very preliminary um, stage that this project is at um, right now, um, I believe that these discussions will help set the agenda uh, for the future activities uh, of the project uh, that um, Professor Norton um, referred to. Um, in this panel, we have um, three uh, speakers, and uh, I think we will go on the, uh, in the same order as they're listed in the program. Um, the first one uh, by uh, uh, our colleague from Tufts University, um, Ibrahim Ward, uh, the Dubai model um, evaluated. Um, the second one um, by um, Christine Diwan, um, the growing uh, middle class. Um, and the third by uh, uh, Professor um, Nadir Habibi um, from um, Brandeis University. Um, I won't um, read their biographies. Um, um, they're here. Um, so without any further ado, we will move now to the first presentation um, by um, Professor Ibrahim Wardi. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank you all uh, for coming. I want to also thank uh, Professor Norton and the organizers. Uh, 
Uh, it's actually appropriate that we are at the business school here and that we are at the Rafi Hariri building, yes, who himself was both uh, a business tycoon and a uh, government official, since my focus is on the Dubai model. And when we talk about the Dubai model, we talk a lot about business and about the so-called Sheikh Mo, the, mm -hmm. the ruler of, uh, of, of, of Dubai. So uh, let me just say that I've been doing a lot of work on the debt crisis in, uh, in Dubai. And uh, as a way of uh, kind of getting myself in the mood, I, I have the habit of watching the news from Dubai every day. Uh, and as all of you know, uh, whenever you watch the official news from that part of the world, it's not terribly exciting, although I, I'm always doing something else on the side. Mm -hmm. But uh, basically, you hear about what the ruler did and who he received, etc. And uh, one day, it was uh, on January 25th, uh, the, the news from Dubai opened with the news that Professor... Uh, Michael Porter of Harvard Business School uh, was in Abu Dhabi, that he gave a talk on the competitiveness of the Emirates. And what was interesting, in addition to the fact that it was uh, uh, kind of the main news of the day, was that uh, we saw for about 10 or 15 minutes uh, the footage from that speech and uh, at um, kind of in the audience was uh, Sheikh Mohammed himself, the ruler of Dubai, his cabinet, and what turned out to be 350 top officials from Dubai. And they were there to listen to this uh, business uh, guru. And as we'll see in a few minutes, uh, that tells us a lot about the kind of mindset uh, in uh, Dubai. Now, I later uh, did some, uh, some research to figure out uh, what Porter was doing there, etc. And one interesting tidbit I gathered uh, from my research was that during uh, Professor Porter's speech, uh, Sheikh Mohammed uh, sent no fewer than four tweets. So he's, uh, he's, he's very much into uh, kind of Facebook and Twitter, et cetera, uh, all of those uh, social uh, networks. So let me talk a little bit about the, the Dubai model and then how it evolved over time and how in some ways it became dysfunctional. So uh, it's very easy to, to summarize what the basics of the Dubai uh, model are in that it's basically an entrepot economy, what economists call an, an entrepot economy, uh, which is uh, entrepot meaning uh, kind of warehouse where basically uh, you, set, you set up a platform for re-exporting uh, products and uh, there are a number of uh, other models that, uh, that uh, Dubai was inspired by. Uh, one is Hong Kong, another one is Singapore. So the basic idea was uh, not to bother much with democracy, but rather focus on economic development. And uh, the model of economic development is very much based on the encouragement of investment and the promotion of, uh, of economic uh, growth. And the, the actual um, uh, focus of, uh, of Dubai was on uh, becoming a major port uh, and uh, of uh, becoming a hub of free trade in, uh, in the region. Um, and uh, to do so, uh, there were really two sets of tools that were essential. One was to build infrastructure, so roads, ports, airports, etc. And the other one was to have a very welcoming uh, legislation to uh, foreign investment and, uh, and in general, uh, commerce. Okay? Um, now, things get a bit complicated uh, when we talk about uh, the, uh, the idea of a Dubai model in an abstract way, because uh, this tends to ignore the, what is specific to, to Dubai. And here I want to mention uh, two or three uh, sets of uh, uh, kind of political and historical details that set Dubai apart from, uh, from other places. Uh, one is, uh, of course, the, the history of uh, Dubai, which was one of the so-called trucial uh, states, and that was once part of what is now uh, the Abu Dhabi, uh, 
uh, emirate. Um, the, in the 1830s, the Al Maktoum family, which still rules Dubai, was anointed by the British as uh, the rulers of that uh, piece of land. But the story of Dubai still is quite complicated. Uh, so you have this very ancient or res reasonably old uh, tribal uh, tradition uh, where you have, again, uh, the, the, the uh, Al Maktoum family that is at the very top. But beyond that, you have many very subtle aspects that outsiders may not uh, fully recognize. One is the rivalry with, uh, with Abu Dhabi. Okay? There was also uh, a very significant rivalry with lesser emirates, uh, such as uh, Sharjah, which at one point was a far more important uh, center than Dubai was in terms of airports and ports, etc. cetera. Um, with, uh, with Abu Dhabi, uh, the rivalry is also complicated or facilitated, depending on how you want to look at that, by uh, marriage, in that the current uh, ruler of, uh, of Dubai, uh, ha so, so the, uh, I, sh I should maybe mention that the family ruling Abu Dhabi and the Emirates is uh, the Al Nahyan family, and the mother of the current ruler of Dubai is, in, uh, uh, is it, it comes from the uh, Al Nahyan family. And uh, you have a very complicated family structure uh, in terms of uh, marriages, etc., that's quite opaque to outsiders. To give you just one example, it is known that, uh, uh, that uh, Sheikh Mohammed uh, has four wives, and the fourth wife is a half-sister of the current king of Jordan. Okay, so that will give you a sense of the kinds of political alliances that come uh, from uh, marriage. But then uh, everything else is quite opaque in terms of how many children, what the children are up to, et cetera. And then the closer you look, the more you learn about uh, why a given member of the royal family or, or the ruling family uh, holds uh, kind of important uh, executive positions and why some others do not. Okay? So the tribal element is quite fundamental to understand the basics of Dubai, because from now on, I'm going to be mostly talking about the corporate element of, uh, of, of, of Dubai. So uh, another interesting historical period is the period between 1968 and 1971, because in 1968, the British announced that they were going to leave uh, the, 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 the region, not, not only Dubai, but the, the whole uh, Gulf region. And uh, in 1971, uh, the United Arab Emirates was uh, created. And during those uh, three years, there were lots of very interesting uh, developments because at one point the British wanted uh, Qatar and Bahrain to be members of this uh, confederation. So there was a lot of a jockeying for supremacy, etc., uh, that uh, that took place during those years. Now, one important detail is that Dubai always liked to consider itself superior to the others. Uh, and uh, many of the decisions made by, uh, by Dubai uh, had this uh, basic feature that Dubai wanted to, to distinguish itself from the others. And that's going to be important in, a, in just a couple of minutes. Now, I was saying that uh, the Sheikh Maud, again, the ruler of, uh, of Dubai, is uh, also something of a, of a CEO. And one of the distinguishing features of Dubai is uh, that it's uh, run almost like a corporation. And here, all it takes is to look at some business school case studies on Dubai, where uh, Sheikh Mohammed is, uh, uh, is uh, treated the way you would expect uh, Bill Gates or other uh, prominent uh, uh, CEOs or former CEOs uh, the way they are depicted in uh, fawning business magazines, uh, etc. So uh, there's the CEO element that's, I think, fundamental to understand uh, what goes on. And the, the small story I told you about uh, Michael Porter and his presence in uh, Dubai, in, uh, it was actually technically in Abu Dhabi that he was giving his talk, is quite revealing. Uh, 
Uh, if you want to uh, get a sense of the coverage of Prince uh, of, uh, of, of Sheikh uh, Mohammed, I think if you try to look for a 60 Minutes uh, segment uh, that's about a year or two years old, uh, you can probably find it on, on YouTube or, or, or elsewhere. You can get a sense of the convergence of business and, uh, and politics. Um, the, the interesting question about the Dubai model is about precisely the limits of a country or an emirate that is run uh, like a corporation. And uh, the, the related uh, question that is worth uh, pondering is uh, whether uh, management techniques and the like uh, are enough for economic development and the achievement of uh, sustainable uh, developments. Now, uh, one other detail about the corporate aspect of Dubai is the mention of the, a book that was uh, written by the ruler of Dubai. And the, the book is titled My Vision in Arabic. And I'm one of probably very few people who have read it, uh, mostly to, to figure out the jargon in Arabic, the kind of MBA speak in, in Arabic. So in the book, you have all of the stuff that is taught in, in business school uh, that is uh, expressed by, uh, by the ruler of, uh, of Dubai. And in that respect, when I was reading it, it reminded me quite a bit of uh, the dot-com boom of the 1990s, in that uh, you had a number of people back then uh, who uh, created fortunes on paper and who had those wonderful business plans, very ambitious uh, plans that made them very wealthy on paper. And uh, of course, as we know, starting in the year 2000, uh, there was the, 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 the end of this uh, dot-com uh, boom. And uh, many of the projects that I won't get into in Dubai, because you've all uh, heard about them, like the world's tallest uh, uh, tower, uh, the biggest this, the biggest that, uh, a kind of a museum of the world, et cetera. You have all those very, very ambitious uh, projects that sound good on, uh, on paper, except that when you pause for a second and you start wondering about whether this is sustainable, you start having uh, doubts about that. Now, the Dubai model, uh, being this uh, regional hub, uh, seemed to work quite nicely up to the point where the model became successful. Because there is a time, uh, especially in the last uh, uh, 10 years or so, where it looked like everybody wanted to become a new Dubai. And uh, this is when I think uh, the overreach started on the part of, uh, of the ruler of uh, Dubai, who incidentally, actually one, one detail I haven't mentioned, is that he's the ruler of, uh, of Dubai, but also the prime minister and the vice president of the UAE. So the institutions of uh, the two, and the UAE consists of seven uh, separate uh, emirates, each of which has its own traditions and its own tribal structure. So uh, keeping in mind uh, those details, you start wondering about, okay, what will uh, Dubai do if Abu Dhabi does the same thing in terms of becoming something of a regional hub, uh, albeit in a less uh, flashy way, if Qatar wants to do the same, uh, etc. And this is where uh, Dubai uh, as a way of distinguishing itself, started to, to uh, get into the business of excess, in that if you look at uh, some of the crazier uh, projects, most of them are of recent vintage. That is, was mostly around 2006, 2007, that you had announcements about those uh, gigantic uh, projects. And uh, in a way, it made sense if you go back in the mindset of... Uh, of uh, Sheikh Mohammed, uh, because every time he's asked about what Dubai wants to be, he answers number one. We want to be world class everywhere. So you have this kind of a business uh, mindset or a business tycoon mindset, which may not make uh, a lot of sense uh, in a government uh, setting. So I want to list some of these contradictions uh, 
that uh, Dubai uh, has been uh, exposed to, uh, at least following uh, the recent uh, crisis. And the, the actual date of the, the crisis is uh, uh, November 25, which is the day when uh, Dubai World announced that its subsidiary, uh, Nakhil, uh, was uh, likely to uh, kind of default on its, uh, uh, on its financial obligations in, term in terms of repaying uh, a debt. It was specifically an Islamic debt, a sukuk, and it asked for a standstill of six months where creditors were basically asked to be patient, uh, essentially saying that Dubai uh, may not have the cash to fulfill its, uh, its obligations. So what happened next was that about three weeks later, uh, on the day when those bonds were due, Abu Dhabi finally stepped in and uh, offered $10 billion to, uh, to Dubai to repay that uh, debt. And so the default did not really happen. But it's quite clear that uh, Dubai was living well beyond uh, its means. So here there's uh, an obvious question, which is, what did uh, Abu Dhabi get in return? Now, the one detail that everybody knows is that uh, just uh, two, three months ago, uh, actually, uh, I think on January 3rd or 4th of 2010, uh, the, the, the tallest building uh, in the world was inaugurated. And uh, this building, which was known as uh, Burj Dubai, was renamed Burj Al Khalifa after the ruler of, uh, of the Emirates and of uh, Abu Dhabi. So that's the one thing we know. Mm -hmm. But there's probably much more beyond that that uh, we can only uh, guess at. So let me go back to these uh, different uh, contradictions. One is that the Dubai model tries to turn uh, Dubai into a global city uh, that is a bit of a champion of globalization. And yet, this happens within a tribal society. And one element that I will mention will give you a sense of uh, this discrepancy between uh, the ideology of globalization and tribalism, which is that it's not quite clear in Dubai uh, where the fortune of the ruler stops and where the, the fortune of uh, the emirate, uh, let alone of individuals or companies uh, within the uh, emirate uh, uh, is. Okay, so this ambiguity about ownership is something that is quite interesting, uh, keeping in mind this ambition of uh, globalization. So this is where a number of people have basically said that Dubai is something of a Potemkin village, whereby you have this kind of ideal uh, city that was uh, created to please uh, Western investors. But when you uh, dig a bit, you, you discover all of the archaic uh, elements of Dubai. Uh, the other interesting question is this contradiction between a purely corporate logic and a political logic. Now, until recently, uh, the idea was that, well, it's not that big a deal because uh, there's less than 10% of the population uh, that is actually Emirati, and uh, 90 plus percent are, are expatriates. So the whole question of uh, democracy and all the other big questions uh, become less important uh, a, as a result. Uh, right now, however, and I'll, I'll get to that uh, in closing in just a couple of minutes, uh, you can see that there is quite a bit of a discontent within uh, the Emirati population over what's, what's going on. So here you, you can see again the, uh, uh, this tension between the corporate logic where you don't care much about uh, the, uh, the different constituencies, and then the political logic, where especially if you consider the tradition of paternalism that exists in the Emirates, uh, can become problematic. Uh, another uh, of the contradictions is the clash between, on the one hand, this ideal of uh, like a perfect little globalized city, and the dangerous neighborhood within which uh, Dubai uh, exists. And here there are a number of different parts of that story, uh, most of which 
have direct political consequences. One is uh, the question of uh, terrorism as well as uh, the Arab-Israeli conflict and other regional conflicts. Now, you've all heard, I'm sure, about the recent targeted assassination, uh, presumably by the Israeli uh, Mossad of a member of Hamas uh, in, uh, in Dubai. And uh, there are a number of very interesting implications there, which is, first of all, how much Dubai can insulate itself from all the conflicts in the region. And the other thing that is uh, lesser known is the actual business ties between uh, Dubai and, and Israel, uh, especially in terms of security uh, businesses, ironically, uh, in terms of surveillance and, and the like. Uh, then there is the, the whole question of uh, money laundering. Now, any of you who have probably, who have been in uh, Dubai or the region have probably seen or uh, kind of been in a position to almost smell the money being laundered there because it is so obvious, especially among uh, Russians uh, who, uh, for whom Dubai was something of a, of a playground. And that's uh, quite a big uh, issue uh, right now in terms of international efforts at uh, money laundering. Another very central issue is the relations with Iran. Okay. Uh, the, Periodically, you hear about people from the U.S. Treasury going to, to Dubai or going to the Emirates in general and asking the Emirates not to deal with Iran. Now, anybody who has been there or who knows anything about the region know how entrenched uh, Iran is in, uh, in uh, the Emirates and specifically in, in Dubai. So typically, what you have is, uh, is statements by Dubai officials to the effect that we're, uh, we're together uh, with the U.S. in this fight against terrorism and uh, with Iran sanctions, etc. You have some uh, statements uh, that are designed to please uh, the U.S., where typically you'd have some cosmetic uh, measures being taken, but uh, nothing of much, uh, much consequence. So you have all of those um, uh, interesting uh, uh, events that uh, have only started coming out recently. Now, there's a line by uh, Warren Buffett, which seems particularly apt, which is that you only learn who has been swimming naked when the tide goes out. And what we are witnessing at some of our largest financial institutions is an ugly sight. Now, that's equally true of what has been happening in, uh, in Dubai. Now, in reading uh, one of the uh, newspapers of the UAE called The National, which comes out of, uh, of uh, Abu Dhabi. There were a couple of very interesting uh, stories. Uh, one was uh, re about revelations about uh, major embezzlement by the head of the DIFC, which is uh, the International Financial Center of, uh, of Dubai. And so it was revealed just yesterday that, uh, that the former head of the DIFC had been embezzling uh, money. There were also another story about uh, the debt renegotiation and where things stand between Dubai and its uh, creditors. And when you travel there or when you talk to people, especially bankers in the region, you keep hearing stories about uh, corruption and uh, about uh, mismanagement and incompetence. And many of those stories are starting to come out uh, right now. So I'm going to start right here. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much. We move to uh, Professor Christine uh, Diwan on the middle class. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. So I'm going to be speaking on the, the middle class. And you can see I've kind of changed the title a little bit. Let me just find that. Um, to be looking at the, I added the word re, the re-emergence of the middle class in the Gulf. Um, this came about um, in thinking about this subject. Uh, when, when Richard Norton uh, contacted me and, and said he wanted to invite me and to have me speak at this conference, he told me, well, I'd really like you to speak about the middle class. And my initial reaction um, was, I'm not sure what the middle class is in the Gulf, um, which is 
a rather telling reaction given that I spend a good amount of my time thinking and writing about political economy in the Gulf states. So I, I sort of frame this talk then in, in trying to, to take up this challenge and to figure out why, why it was um, that I had some difficulty thinking about um, the middle class and, and how kind of separating the middle class from a lot of other elements that as political scientists we tend to, to look at in the Gulf. So um, I'm going to structure the talk then a little bit as a, a meta narrative then, because what I'd like to do is to, to kind of take you on a tour of political science literature and how people have been looking or how scholars have looked at the middle class in the Gulf. And I'm doing this in the faith that, um, in the end, the, that looking at this literature is going to tell us something about the actual middle class and the evolutions that have taken place in it. And I hope that my faith is well placed in doing that. And I will, by the end, uh, speak a little bit about the growing middle class and give you a little bit more factual things about how we can um, think about it today. So, so if you look, what's interesting is if you look at a lot of the literature from like the 1970s and 1980s, you really did have a lot of people focusing on the middle class. And this was something that people really looked to in trying to understand evolution and change um, in the Gulf region. And this literature really, I mean, I think you can tell even just sort of glancing at the PowerPoint slide and the kind of things we're going to talk about, really came about um, as part and parcel of the modernization literature um, that had evolved at the time. And this kind of literature really placed the middle class, kind of saw it as a vanguard class, right? A class that's both a product of modernization and state formation. And you can see all these different processes that really do go about in, in forming the, the middle class, right? Urbanization, a secular education. And so you see through these sort of big social, social economic transformations, um, the evolution of a lot of new class uh, positions and employment as managers, administrators, technicians, clerks, and teachers. And the idea then is that from these transformations then, you're going to create a new class that's going to see the world differently, have new values, have new interests, and it's this class then that is going to push for political change in the region. Um, some people saw this sort of revolutionary class, of course, coming from the role that the middle class played in some of the other Arab states, um, you know, some of them involved in coups and this sort of thing through the military, but are also more just a class that might be able to push for greater, you know, kind of modernization of, of the economy and maybe eventually pushing for things like political accountability, meritocratic advancement, socio-cultural change that would lead the Gulf to start to look a little bit more like societies we might see in the, in the West. Um, and of course, part of this presumption was that this middle class then, as, as people move to the cities and as they start to take up these new positions, they're going to be less tied to these old social forms of tribe and, and religion and this sort of thing. What's interesting, though, is that after this time, when you see in the literature a lot of people are looking at the middle class, the middle class sort of starts to disappear um, as a subject of analysis. And my question then was, was, why is that? Why is that the case? Why do we stop reading about the middle class all the time? And this is particularly telling, it's around the time that I was you know, studying, so the things that I would be looking at. And I think part of the answer to that um, can be found in um, a subject, I mean, I took actually this title or from the subtitle of Ali Nasser's new book, maybe some of you had read that, um, looking at the rise of the Muslim middle class. And I think what happened was, as opposed to like what a lot of modernization theorists and people thought, of course, this, this new middle class came about and was accompanied, in, in fact, by a resurgence in traditional Islamic belief. It didn't overcome that. It actually brought those ideas with it. And I think because of that, when scholars were looking at this then, the economic analysis gets pretty much eclipsed by just the study of Islamic movements. And so we lose sort of the economic element of studying what's going on economically with these people, and we just start studying Islamic movements. So you start to see a lot of literature about Islamic movements and what's going on in the Gulf and the rise of Islamic movements and this sort of thing. And I think, in fact, though, um, we can learn a lot if we, if we try to, instead of separating these two, if we really try to hold these two things together. And we spend more time looking more closely at how these identity changes that we started writing about a lot in terms of Islamic movements actually are linked to shifts in the political economy of Gulf states. 
And I'm going to try to illustrate that a little bit through some research that I've been spending a lot of time in, in looking at um, the rise of Islamic finance. And I'm going to particularly look at that in terms of Kuwait. So just to kind of ground it in one state. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some research that I've been doing in Kuwait. Now, if you think about Kuwait, I don't, I don't know how many of you have experience in looking at Kuwait. We just heard about um, uh, the United Arab Emirates and sort of what they look like. Kuwait really sort of has this history as being a merchant republic, right? Merchants were very important, um, as they were in Dubai, to the, the formation of the state. And they were always very important actors, both in public life and economic life, and really dominated the economy and, and even the politics in the early years of, of, of Kuwait. Um, of course, we know that, that when oil comes in, that really elevates the ruling family. But as a lot of scholars like Jill Crystal and others have taught us, the merchants were pretty much able to leverage the social coherence that they had um, into a continued stake in the oil economy. So that you see that merchants still continue, even after oil, to play a really big role in the economic life of the state of Kuwait. Um, and, and really, uh, if you start to look at it, the Al-Sabah did a lot to sort of structure markets, give them protected markets, that gave them kind of a playground and a really protected role in the economy in Kuwait. If you look um, in the 1970s, or late 1970s then, we do have this entry of a, a new player um, in Kuwait. And, and this is just a picture of the main headquarters of Kuwait Finance House, Beit al Kuwaiti, which is uh, the main and the largest Islamic bank in Kuwait. And when I came to sort of look and, and think about this bank, um, what's interesting, if you look into its history, um, and in these early years, you know, or right around this time when oil is, is coming about and the like, you still had these old merchant families really dominating the financial sector in Kuwait. So all of the big merchant families, they kind of divvied up, and they were using the, the big banks mostly to finance their own business and this sort of thing. And what's interesting then, for a lot of political reasons I won't get into, is that there was um, given an opening around this time for the creation of um, an Islamic bank. And I want to put forth the argument here that this basically this Islamic bank can be seen in some part as a vehicle by rival elites that were really interested in getting into this sector in Kuwait that had become a rather oligarchic sector in terms of who was um, in charge of the financial sector. And they were able to do this because, of course, by applying um, the, the rules of Islamic law and finance to kind of break in through another kind of back door with the help of the ruling family and to create their own bank. And so it was in a way a, a, a way to break into this oligarchy. And if you look then at how sort of these rival elites used this bank, I think it's fair to say that they were, they were very sensitive to the rising sort of middle class that was emerging at this time in Kuwait because of the oil economy. And they were very interested in serving this group in a way that you didn't see a lot of the other big merchant-run banks doing at the time. And so you see the kind of things that uh, Kuwait Finance House was involved in was really trying to serve the needs of this middle class mostly through kind of the consumer economy. So you see them getting very involved in purchasing cars to sell to people, building supplies, these sorts of things, things that uh, the middle class were very interested in as the oil wealth kind of filtered down and people needed to purchase, purchase more goods. And so in a way, Islamic finance kind of situated itself within this rising middle class economy, and I think it's a good reflection of what that economy looked like. What's interesting, though, and this is just a picture of uh, Walid al-Tabtabai, he's a Salafi minister in the Kuwaiti parliament, is that at, as the you know, Kuwait Finance House did really well um, and was able to leverage a lot of sort of its linkages and establish linkages with um, government and charitable associations, they were able to build kind of a lot more social and economic institutions in the country. And a lot of the linkages, which I won't go into detail right now, uh, allowed them then to start to put more pressure or to, or to just color basically the way that public life, life looked in Kuwait. And so you really see um, sort of these broad processes of Islamization taking place in the state through kind of the linkages of these different organizations. <coughs> 
And so then you start to see it communicated into directly into the political sector. So push for gender segregation of uh, public institutions like Coit University, banning of music festivals, um, and push for more implementation of Sharia law in different aspects of life. And so by the end of the 1990s, you see that, um, or even the middle of the 1990s, a lot of Kuwaiti liberals or and a lot of people from the merchant classes began to feel that they were losing not only some of their dominance in business, but also uh, some of the freedom um, in their way of life. And you can see this uh, communicated, ironically, in um, a survey that was done by the National Bank of Kuwait, the main rival, co conventional rival to the Kuwait Finance House at the time. Um, and they started basically looking at this rise of Islamic finance and realizing that they were going to have to pay attention to the scoring market, um, started doing surveys, um, polling the Kuwaiti public. And what's interesting, in the early 1990s, um, this is how they saw, by asking a lot of questions, this is the way that they would characterize the Kuwaiti public. You can see 20% liberal, 45% uh, conservative, and 35% Islamic. But by 2000, they had started to see sort of the growth of um, sort of a new movement that didn't fit kind of the, the characteristics that they had set up through the questioning. Um, and they had to actually create a new category to capture this new group. And they called them modern Islamics, which I think kind of perfectly identifies the sort of attitude that uh, banks like Kuwait Finance House were trying to push, was an idea that you can still be Muslim and participate in this rising, growing middle class and in a modern banking society. And um, you can see then kind of the general shift then towards Islamism in the society. So where does that leave us today then? And I think if you look today, and, and not just in Richard Norton asking me to talk about the middle class, I think you are seeing a kind of increasing interest then in economic categories when we look at the Gulf. And Part of the, I mean, part of it, I mean, this is just a map, this is just a graph showing uh, Saudi total goods exports, but it's a pretty good kind of stand-in reflection of how the, um, basically, the, the, the region has been shifting through the different oil booms. And, of course, we have the early, the 1970s, late 1970s, when the first oil boom came, um, was kind of the initiation of global, fi of Islamic finance. Um, uh, the kind of period I was talking about then is sort of the long middle sector. And now we have this, the second oil boom. And I think everybody's still kind of in the process of trying to figure out what this boom means in terms of these different social classes and how things are going to change. And so I find it interesting that in the context of this, we are seeing renewed interest in the middle class. And I want to cite um, one study that was done recently. The title is, is here is taken from that study by um, James Zugby, who maybe some of you know. He did this in coordination with the McKinsey Group. Um, wrote a report called Shedding Light on the Gulf's Middle Class. And when he started looking at the middle class, I was really struck by his initial findings. And he did this in a survey. It was looking at um, Saudi Arabia, UAE, and Bahrain. And in the survey that he did, two-thirds of the respondents identified themselves as being part of the middle class. So it was a self-identified um, way of approaching it. Um, and they were largely urbanized salaried employees uh, the salary range uh, was pretty broad. It was from about 1,500 U.S. dollars a month to 8,000 U.S. dollars a month. But the, if you look at this class on the first kind of uh, view of it that he took, he found that they had slightly more kind of global attitudes. They had been educated more different, differently than a lot of earlier generations. Um, they showed really high job satisfaction, actually. Most of them seemed happy with their jobs. They were fairly forward-looking. Most of them looked to the future and, and felt pretty confident about that, thought things might look better in the future than they did now, in fact. And there was also increasingly um, kind of a somewhat contradiction with the global aspect, um, a willingness to look at themselves as part of their, their national identity, so to identify as Kuwaitis or as Saudis more than as Arabs or, or even Muslims, which is interesting. But uh, what I found funny with this, this was sort of the first cut that he took on the survey, and, and I was struck by a lot of the attitudes and the way it was characterized really sounded a lot like the hopes and the early dreams that people and political scientists had for this early era when people were looking at the middle class, right? This is a different class, it's more global, they have different attitudes, they're gonna to take a different uh, view and maybe change um, Gulf society. 
But I was struck by a couple of years later then, he came out and he started looking more closely at the data and kind of cutting it, um, dissecting it in different ways. And when Zogby started doing that, um, I, th I think it's really interesting, the stuff that I read, and I haven't seen all of his um, analysis of it, is that if you look actually at this middle class though, maybe the fir first cut wasn't giving you the whole picture. And that if you disaggregate this middle class a little bit more, you start to see real gaps in attitudes. And the two big variations he saw were if you started to cut it by generation, so by certain ages, um, he found that the older generation was actually much more satisfied and much happier and more forward-looking than the younger generations, which is kind of surprising. And then the other big divide um, was really between public sector and private sector workers. And I mentioned that when they had this self-identified middle class, they really were, for the large part, salaried workers. So the sort of people we would think of white, kind of white-collar workers. But what's interesting, though, is when he started to disaggregate, you saw a really big difference between the attitudes of public workers, public sector workers, workers from the state, and workers from the private sector. And basically, and especially in Saudi Arabia, the public sector workers were much better paid and felt much more secure, and their attitudes were much more optimistic and hopeful. While the private sector uh, tended to be either lower, so paid much less, or be paid much more. So they were on kind of the other two spectrums. And you had quite varied attitudes there, but in general, the private sector then saw a lot less security, and uh, uh, on the most part, we're learning less, or a good aspect of them. So I think this is part, I mean, any of you who studied the Gulf have probably seen, you know, we have, of course, this whole issue that the whole kind of rentier economy was always um, established and kind of worked by hiring Gulfies in the public sector, and that was basically a way to distribute the wealth. And as we all know that these states have, are finding it difficult, or at least many of the states in Saudi Arabia, for sure, to continue in this kind of system and are trying to move more and more young workers into the private sector. But what the survey is telling us is that these people, one, they don't want to go, <laughs> and two, when they go, they're feeling much less secure, and you see the attitude's quite different. And I think this is also striking because if we try to think about the middle class and attitudes we usually have about the middle class, if we're really here looking at what's the middle middle class of this, it's not going to be people that are entrepreneurial and forward-looking in this sort of thing. The real middle class is actually these private sector workers that are trying to hold on to their jobs, at least if you take from what his survey is. And I think since um, I thought pretty much closer, but I wanted to make one more point because I kind of framed a lot of this talk and, and trying to link and, and say that there's something that can be really revealing about Gulf politics if you try to hold these political economy categories with a lot of cultural categories and see what the dynamic that's going on. And there's one thing that I've witnessed in Kuwait again coming about from this divide that you see between the private sector and the public sector. And it's another catch cultural category. So I think just like as we saw Islamism rise and kind of take over um, our political economy literature, there's another category I think you're gonna be hearing a lot more about and you're already hearing about it in Kuwait and that is this whole issue of tribes. Obviously, tribes have always been a big part of Gulf societies. It's not like they don't exist, but I think it's becoming more politically relevant right now. Um, if you're in Kuwait, you're hearing a lot more now about Hadar versus Bedou. <laughs> now, of course, Bedou, we don't have Bedouins in Kuwait anymore. This is an urbanized population, much like the middle class that we talked about before. But there's becoming a lot more friction between the interests of the urban classes and this late arriving class of Bedouin who basically came after the merchants and even after a lot of the urban middle classes and didn't have access to the same kind of capital and same kind of opportunities in the private sector that the other classes did. And so now you're seeing these people that are much more dependent on these public sector jobs fighting fiercely to really keep them. And a lot of that is getting, it's, a, it's an economic issue but because of the way of the evolution of the state, you're seeing it played out in cultural categories with a lot of people talking about the Bedouin and this sort of thing and the problems the, that come about from them not moving forward and not being more entrepreneurial and these sorts of things. So that's it. Let me stop there. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker, uh, Professor Nadir Habibi from uh, Brandeis on the markets. Got it, thank you. Okay, good afternoon. Um, uh, 
the specific topic of my talk today is the relationship between GCC countries and Asian countries. Um, and I think this is an important um, development for the Asian economies as well as the GCC economies um, because of the significance of GCC in terms of its um, contribution to the um, energy supplies that they bec are becoming far more important for Asian countries. But as I will explain, the relationship with Asia is also important for GCC countries, both from geopolitical point of view and economic uh, point of view. Um, there, it appears that over the past two decades, uh, there, there has been a consistent growth of both diplomatic and economic relations between um, GCC countries and uh, major Asian countries, specifically China and India. And there are a number of reasons for this um, mutual attraction between these two um, blocks, although they are very different in size. Um, the, the primary reason uh, for this is that um, oil, which is abundant in GCC, is becoming more and more important and more and more needed for China and India. China was a country that uh, uh, was self-sufficient in imports of, in production and consumption of oil till 1993, but it has become uh, more dependent on imported oil ever since, and in 2009, it imported 3.5 million, million barrels of oil per day, um, which is quite significant. And a large portion of that came from um, Middle East, specifically from um, Saudi Arabia and uh, Oman, and also uh, outside GCC from, from Iran. Um, on the other hand, the uh, GCC countries are interested in the relation with um, China and India because uh, their economies are growing, they need a significant amount of capital goods, manufactured goods, and GC, uh, Chinese uh, economy is the, really the best uh, source of these kinds of exports that they need. Therefore, there is a complementarity of exports and imports between GCC and um, Chinese economy. The Indian economy as well is a major supply of lowest skilled and professional human capital to GCC. In Saudi Arabia alone, about 1.4 million Indians uh, are working as expatriate workers. And in the past 10 years, the Indian economy has grown significantly. Uh, India has more goods and, ex and services to offer. But more importantly for GCC economies, uh, these economies have a significant amount of uh, surplus oil revenue that they need to invest in um, international capital markets or in, in international markets overall. Uh, traditionally, these um, um, Arab um, foreign investments were focused on United States and Europe. But lately, especially after September 11 terrorist attacks, um, GCC countries and their sovereign wealth funds that manage these large amounts of funds have been looking to alternative um, um, markets or alternative places for investment for both economic reasons and uh, um, political reasons. Economically, um, they used to invest their assets in safe uh, um, assets such as the treasury bills in the United States or um, government in, or bank deposits in Europe, but uh, they have become more skilled in managing investments and their own money. Now they are interested in going into equity investment, and for that they are looking at emerging markets, in particular to, to Asia. And we, see a, we have seen a surge of investment uh, from GCC uh, into um, China and India in, in recent years. Um, between China and GCC countries with respect to investment, there seems to be a bilateral flow. Uh, China is interested in investing in GCC countries, and GCC countries are interested in investing in, in China. Uh, especially in the field of energy, this is quite visible. Uh, Saudi Arabia and Kuwait are main uh, GCC countries that are interested in China. And in the field of energy, they are interested in setting up refineries in China, which will allow them to transport their own crude oil, refine it, and distribute it in China. And that allows them to generate significantly more profit. Uh, overall, 
Saudi, uh, the GCC countries are interested in reliable long-term customers for their uh, oil, crude oil and oil products, and they seem to view the Asian markets, China and India in particular, as the most attractive uh, markets. Therefore, they are interested in long-term relations and long-term investments, which will facilitate their exports of their oil and oil products. Uh, China, on the other hand, is um, searching for oil globally. And Chinese oil firms have been trying to invest and uh, help as joint partners develop the oil um, uh, production capacity of any country that could become a long-term supplier of oil. Um, Chinese, um, um, one of the Chinese companies called Sinok, a large Chinese oil company, is now uh, actively um, uh, searching for oil in the Rob Al Khali, the empty quarter of Saudi Arabia. Aramco, the largest um, oil company in the world, the Saudi Arabian oil company, has uh, signed a partnership to develop a large refinery in Fujian province in China, and also, along with that, another contract for um, control of about 750 distribution centers and gas stations in China. And the reason for this also is that the heavy oil of Saudi Arabia is um, is not desired by many refineries. It needs special equipment and a special design uh, for being uh, refined. And uh, Saudis are trying to build a refinery in China that will help them process that. Uh, similarly with India, uh, Saudi companies and Kuwaiti companies have been negotiating and trying to uh, uh, in involve in joint ventures to um, develop refineries, and in some cases they have been simply buying shares or buying minority partnership in existing um, refineries in India, again to help them um, export their oil. Uh, Aside from energy, there is interest in uh, real estate and um, also manufacturing, but primarily real estate. In the case of real estate, the, uh, the Islamic banks uh, in GCC have been uh, instruments for transferring GCC uh, funds into real estate projects in several um, uh, Asian countries. Uh, there are projects in uh, um, Malaysia, in Indonesia, uh, some in China itself, and um, the Asian countries seem very eager to uh, try to attract these. Um, even a country like Singapore is looking into Islamic options for raising funds so that they can tap into the wealth of um, religious, conservative, um, wealthy Muslims in, in GCC countries. Um, so, so far for um, um, investment. But um, as an economist, I cannot do a presentation without showing you some graphs and data. That's what we do to look mysterious to others. Um, so I like to, <laughs> although I'm, I promised we were warned to avoid um, oil, so I'm going to skip the discussion. We'll just by briefly just pointing out that projections show that the non-OECD Asia, which means primarily uh, growing uh, Asian countries besides uh, Japan and South Korea, would really account for a significant amount of oil consumption by 2030, which is a, an important reason why um, GCC is so important for uh, Asian countries. Here is again another projection as to uh, how the demand for oil in China and India will grow compared to others. We observe that within Asia, uh, China and uh, India are going to have the fastest growth of demand for oil, whereas Japan would be um, actually be able to reduce its demand for oil. Let me skip this and uh, go to the trade relationship between um, Asia and GCC. And I'm going to here primarily focus on relations between um, um, GCC and China and GCC and India. Uh, what you observe here is really the uh, uh, exports and imports of China to GCC, and we see that um, these have grown significantly. Uh, and also we observe that uh, in terms of um, advantage, the the imports of China is significantly uh, larger than uh, its exports to GCC because of oil and the rapid increase in price of oil, which is 
clearly here, showing the sharp increase in imports. But we, we see throughout, especially after 2001, the steady growth in um, both imports and exports of, of China. And this was particularly facilitated and accelerated after the visit of uh, King Abdullah in uh, 2006. In January of 2006, uh, soon after he was uh, appointed as a king. Um, he visited uh, China as one of his first visits. And three months uh, later, the Chinese uh, the president, uh, Hu Jintao, visited in April of the same year, visited Saudi Arabia immediately after visiting Washington, just to uh, demonstrate the significance of uh, GCC countries to um, China. Uh, we look at India, a similar picture emerges. Uh, for a long time, the amount of exports and imports were limited, under 10 billion. But after 2005, we observe again a sharp increase in both exports and imports. Uh, well, this is just the, in absolute value. But it's, it's, uh, I think it's interesting to look at the relative market share of uh, Asian countries compared to Europe and United States as to whether they have been able to um, increase their market share or re not in the um, GCC economies. Because of our high oil revenues, GCC uh, has become a very important import market. You know, in other words, an important market for exports of industrial countries, advanced economies. And you see here the amount of imports of GCC compared to other Arab countries. And we observe that the GCC countries, their imports has uh, grown to almost uh, near $300 billion from a, um, an amount of under $100 billion just in 2003. Therefore, the market is, is very important, and every country is looking into it. So let's look at what has happened to the um, share of the uh, United States in, uh, in the um, GCC markets. The, the dark blue color line shows the US share, and we see that it has been traditionally small. But it has also uh, declined to a lower level after, in, after 2000, primarily. Although we observe the same decline in US share in other parts of the world, the, this uh, line shows the condition of US mar market share in developing countries as a group. But nevertheless, we observe this uh, declining trend uh, after uh, mid-1990s. What about European countries? Uh, again, the dark blue line shows the gradual decline in the market share of European countries in GCC, and that is also uh, in line with the, the similar, similar trends that's being experienced uh, by uh, European market share in rest of the emerging market. So if those um, major exporters are losing market share, who is gaining market share? And here, the country that stands out is China. And as you observe here, the Chinese market share was very small, only about 4%. But recently, it has increased to about 8%. It's still very um, small compared to the European share, because Europe is the dominant partner of GCC economies. But we observe this clear increase in um, Chinese market share at the same time that the market shares of the United States and uh, European countries are declining. So um, what I think that implies is that um, the competition for both investment and uh, trade uh, access to the markets of GCC economies, uh, in my view, is going to intensify in the coming years. The price of oil, although after a rapid increase in 2008 has diminished, it has remained steady at a comfortable level for many oil exporting countries, around uh, 70 to $90 uh, at present, which uh, means that these countries continue to have um, adequate supplies of oil revenues, which can both uh, fuel their imports from the rest of the world and give them enough resources to invest in the uh, rest of the world. Uh, what about uh, the impact of uh, the rise of China's presence in the region on uh, the relationship between uh, China and United States with, with regard to the uh, uh, GCC countries. Well, um, by looking at uh, some of the uh, statements and comments made uh, by um, American analysts, it, it, it's clear that the United States is concerned about the role of China 
uh, in the region. Uh, it doesn't have to be necessarily a bad role, but is, China is recognized as a uh, competitor. Uh, I mentioned the uh, Chinese oil company Sinok that is now um, uh, exploring for natural gas in Saudi Arabia. Uh, prior to awarding that country to uh, contract to Sinok, the Chinese company, uh, several uh, Western oil companies, including Exxon and Shell, were competing for that uh, option, but they couldn't reach an agreement with uh, um, Saudi Arabia, partly because the Saudi um, politicians, those in the oil industry, were concerned that if they uh, bring in um, a large foreign partner, especially a Western partner, <coughs> gradually the influence of uh, multinational companies in their oil sector will increase and uh, it might lead to future political pressure for uh, privatization. Um, there is also a geopolitical dimension to um, the interest of GCC countries in expanding their ties with China and India. And uh, part of that is because of uh, the tensions between United States and GCC countries um, in, with respect to uh, the um, uh, inability or lack of desire on U.S. side to resolve the um, Arab-Israeli conflict, uh, which uh, is a source of uh, frustration for uh, um, Arab populations, which uh, um, contributes to the uh, um, militancy and radicalization of uh, the Islamic youth in these countries. Therefore, the governments are also concerned. And um, the, as a result of that, a way of expressing um, displeasure with uh, a lack of success on the uh, Arab-Israeli front, in my view, has been an interest in uh, GCC countries to diversify their economic relationship to um, rely more on relations with Asia uh, for, that, for that purpose. Um, uh, another point to mention, may, may I ask you how much time do I have? Just about to finish. Okay, just uh, one more point. Um, at the same time that, uh, that China is trying to expand its economic ties with Saudi Arabia, it has also tried to expand its ties with Iran. And the question of how will the uh, uh, Chinese-U.S. competition in the um, Gulf region uh, work itself out in the future really depends on the path that uh, China... Uh, chooses to, to go. One possible scenario is that uh, um, we might end up with a Cold War situation where um, Iran will become a client of China and the GCC countries and other moderate Arab countries would become clients of the United States and there would be this tension between them. But another option is that uh, if China recognizes that uh, relations with GCC countries are more important than uh, its relations with China, it might opt to really focus on closer relations with Arabs and uh, um, sort of um, choose a more cooperative path with respect to uh, uh, the existing tensions between Iran and United States. But uh, those are some of the strategic things that uh, are worth thinking about. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. We have about um, 45 minutes, by my reckoning for our discussion before the break uh, at uh, 3.15. Uh, so the floor is open. If you would kindly identify yourself uh, when you ask a question, and as much as possible direct it to one or more of our panelists. Uh, yes, way back there. Hi. Okay. Hi, this is Sadia Kamar. I'm uh, vi currently visiting the United States. I'm Pakistani-based journalist based in Karachi. Just wanted uh, Dr. Nadir Hussain Habibi to say a few words about GCC and Pakistan. Can you throw a light on that, please? Thank you. Uh, yes. Um, there, there, there has been some uh, movements to encourage investment by GCC in, in Pakistan, um, in uh, manufacturing, in, in banking, which um, in a way cooperation between the um, Islamic banks in GCC country with uh, some banks in Pakistan to finance uh, 
uh, real estate projects. Uh, another area of interest for GCC in, uh, with respect to Pakistan and some other Asian countries is to develop uh, agricultural investment. Uh, that's part of the food security policy of GCC countries. They, these countries are thinking of investing in agricultural production in uh, countries like Vietnam, Pakistan, uh, I believe some areas in of course, some parts of Africa as well, for the purpose of exporting those food um, products back to their own uh, country. So in, in, within that context also, there has been some uh, cooperation between Pakistan and uh, GCC countries. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Kazemi. Uh, this is actually a brief comment and a question from Ibrahim uh, Warda. Um, I just want to put the plug, since you mentioned the political structure in UAE, about uh, Andrea Rue's book, which really deals with all the issues that you raise about the political structure and the intermarriage and so forth. But I have a question for you, Ibrahim, if I may. To what extent Dubai's relationship with Iran economically contributed to the crisis that Dubai is facing now? Uh, well, first of all, about Andrea Rue's book, I fully agree with you. It's an excellent book on a topic that uh, she was the, the she is the wife of a former ambassador to the UAE. So, in that capacity, she was able to understand the social structure in terms of the tribes, etc. So, it, it is a very useful book to figure out again all the stuff that is uh, under the the radar. On the question of um, uh, Iran. And, uh, and, and Dubai, well, it is a factor. It is not the crucial factor. Now, let me just say a couple of things about Iran and, uh, uh, and Dubai. Uh, first of all, there's um, kind of uh, very old ties uh, between, uh, between uh, Iran and Dubai. And there's a huge number of Iranians uh, living in Dubai. And Dubai has been a bit of uh, you know, the expression that is often used with that. It's, uh, it's Dubai that has allowed Iran to breathe, given the sanction regime to which it was uh, subjected. So uh, the um, kind of the flip side of that, of all those close ties, is that there's a lot of what is called hot money. And hot, by hot money, it's not necessarily illegal uh, or uh, it's not kind of money laundering, uh, certainly not, not necessarily, but it's the kind of money that comes and goes uh, very fast. And uh, many of the Iranians who are in Dubai and who play an important role are uh, important figures in business, okay? Some of them have uh, have been there for, for, for more than one generation and are uh, kind of almost indistinguishable from locals. But then there are lots of Iranians who did uh, participate in the buildup of the bubble, of the real estate bubble. And uh, the thing about uh, the Iranian factor in terms of the bubble is that there were people who were quite attuned to what was going on. I, I go to Dubai often enough to have a sense of, uh, uh, again, uh, the mood at any given time. Now, if you're right next door, or if you've, uh, you, you, ca you can uh, really watch like on a daily basis what's going on in the, in the market, then you can, uh, you can be pretty good at uh, calling uh, the end of the bubble. And I think part of what I have observed is that uh, Dubai had been trying to delay the bursting of the bubble for a while. And one thing I've noticed in my trips there was that it was a bit like with real estate in the US or like earlier, the, the dot-com phenomenon, that people were aware that it was unsustainable. And yet they figured that they could still make money because they'll be able to leave at the top. In other words, uh, in the last stages of a bubble, that's really where a lot of the money can be made, but also where a lot of the money can be lost. And in that respect, I think if you look at the hot money uh, element, uh, the Iranian component in terms of the hot money was quite substantial. Uh, part of it is that uh, the Iranians are much more comfortable uh, doing business in Dubai than in other places, uh, in part because of the historical uh, connection uh, but, uh, but, but also because uh, it was a climate 
uh, of uh, like anything goes that was conducive to uh, to speculation. So what the the Dubai government had been doing was um, uh, was deny that there was a bubble forming. So if you go back and look at the statements made by uh, Dubai officials in the last uh, few years, they were saying, oh no, it's not a bubble at all. All this real estate that's building already has tenants, et cetera. And then there were also the rules uh, that, were, uh, that were imposed uh, whereby you, uh, landlords uh, were not, uh, uh, kind of were, were not to post signs uh, advertising the vacancy, etc. So all sorts of tricks that were used. Another trick that was used was in terms of marketing, trying to attract some high-profile uh, investors in uh, Dubai. For example, they would announce that Beckham, the the, the soccer star, uh, had uh, had bought uh, a house. That Elton John did that, etc. So the idea was to have some so-called marquee name that would attract other investors. And uh, where, where it became tricky to manage was in the final stages, like after, uh, essentially after the fall of 2008, which incidentally is when uh, Dubai had announced that another tower, even taller than what is now called uh, Burj Khalifa, would be built by Nakhil, which is precisely the company that has been in, uh, that has been having uh, problems. Now, some people uh, I, I've talked to in my uh, in my recent trips there would impute some uh, some political objectives, etc., which might have been a minor factor. But I think the bubble was really there for everybody to see that it was not really sustainable. So the Iranian factor might have been a minor factor, but I don't think it was the, the, the crucial factor. It, it, might have del uh, it might have accelerated uh, the bubble or changed the timing, but the bubble was clearly there. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Thierman. Uh, so my question is to um, anybody on the panel. There was some discussion of what happened. Um, there was some discussion of what happened after 9-11 and uh, the Gulf states uh, decided not to put their money into the U.S. Now, almost nine years on, and with the stability of the global market, and certainly now that the oil price is going up, what's your sense and prognosis maybe in the next year, two years, is any of the money, other than Dubai, which doesn't have any, mm -hmm. uh, from Saudi, Dub Abu Dhabi, is it looking to come back into the U.S. markets, and where would that focus be? Do you want me to Are address that? Yes. Sure. Um, first of all, it, uh, it's not clear how much money left the United States. Um, the, the, there were some reports that, uh, for example, Saudis withdrew some money, but it, there is no exact data as to how much money left. What I'm talking about, uh, flow of investment, was the additional gen income that was generated uh, between 2003 and 2008, which they chose to invest, for example, more in Asia or other countries. Uh, overall, um, because their oil wealth is so significant, they really cannot avoid investing in mature markets of the United States and Europe. There is a limited uh, capacity in emerging market countries, even in China, for absorbing these um, investments. Um, and uh, in 2009, the Chinese government itself imposed some restrictions on acceptance of foreign investment uh, because they were worried about instability of their economy. They had already uh, more than 70 billion direct investment in that year. So uh, I, d I don't think there would be an end to GCC investment in uh, U.S. markets for both uh, political and uh, economic reasons. There are still the... There are so many uh, investment opportunities that are considered sound, especially now that some uh, companies have had their value declined, and the, if there is potential for positive growth, uh, those might be attractive investments. And for political reasons, because the uh, the strategic relations between U.S. and GCC countries, which has an important security dimension, uh, sort of creates an obligation on the side of uh, GCC countries to maintain some certain amount of investment in uh, dollar assets. If I may I add yeah. uh, just a comment. I've written a whole book on, on the question of the financial aspects of the war on terror. 
Uh, there are really two, uh, two dimensions there. Part of it is what uh, you, you just heard, which is uh, that you have the uh, government reserves, like in Saudi Arabia, et cetera, whatever surpluses are generated. And the matter was more political than, than anything else, like the, the old joke ba going back to the 1970s, where that as soon as the new, there's a new Secretary of State in the US, he goes to Israel. And as soon as there's a new Secretary of the Treasury, he goes to Saudi Arabia. In that, the, the idea was uh, that uh, investments in uh, uh, the US Treasuries was essential for, in terms of uh, uh, the, the US, and it became, again, part of what was expected on the part of Saudi Arabia, et cetera. Now, if you look at the private sector investments uh, in the US, now, I, I, th there was quite a significant uh, amount of withdrawals because I, I did do some research in the region at the time, and it was clear that many wealthy Saudis and Emiratis, et cetera, felt like being sitting ducks in the U.S. Uh, in just in, in case their money would get, uh, uh, would get frozen. Uh, there was a whole uh, cottage industry in terms of... Uh, uh, authors uh, purporting to uh, explain terrorist financing, and uh, there were some generic categories that were so broad in terms of like Saudi businesses and things like that uh, that were accused of uh, financing terrorism. And the mood was such that uh, the the U.S. administration was a bit kind of trigger happy when it came to to freezing accounts. So so there was a significant amount of uh, withdrawals. Uh, but then what I've observed also was that uh, if you look at things like private equity uh, investments, there has been a bit of a return of, uh, of Middle Eastern uh, money to the U.S., uh, I would say, in the last three years or so. So there was a time where uh, Middle Eastern investors were truly scared of investing in the U.S. for fear that, uh, that their money might, uh, might be frozen. Uh, but uh, the, the, those fears have lessened, although there's still uh, some kind of an aftertaste of uh, what had happened soon after September 11. Now, Dr. Tierman. <laughs> um, again, on Dubai, I think uh, one, one thing that struck me about the, the 2008 uh, financial problem was that it came at a time when there were also, over the past three or four years, there were problems with other aspects of Dubai's public image, shall we say, or the problems that uh, they were having, particularly um, uh, with uh, association with terrorist financing, for example, money laundering more generally, but also as being uh, fingered as one of the major sex trafficking centers in the world and, and uh, other forms of illegal trafficking. And it, and it brings to mind a, a sort of a general question of confidence in Dubai itself, not necessarily the model, the Dubai model, but Dubai itself. Um, and that is, um, is it viewed um, or I is it in danger of being viewed as an unreliable, almost criminal state that uh, can no longer attract investment, uh, can no longer serve as a kind of model it has? Well, uh, it's certainly true that in terms of like sex trafficking and even uh, something else, which is the, the treatment of, uh, of foreign workers, especially at the, the kind of lower rungs uh, in terms of construction workers, et cetera, uh, there were a number of uh, stories, uh, kind of many of them true, about, uh, again, the mistreatment of peoples in terms of human trafficking and, uh, and, and, and the like. That's a real problem. And this, again, goes back to this um, uh, built-in contradiction between any kind of anything-goes environment where uh, there are very few controls and bad stuff happening. And uh, for a while, uh, it was kept under wraps. And it's true that uh, it's only kind of relatively recently that uh, people have become more vocal. Uh, there were also some uh, groups organizing, some of the victims of these kinds of shady businesses uh, trying to organize. Now, the official response of uh, the Dubai government is that uh, things are under control. 
And here it's interesting, uh, again, a story that you've all heard about, this recent assassination that I've talked about, uh, which highlighted the extent of the surveillance uh, that, uh, that you have in, um, in Dubai, where there are kind of cameras everywhere. It's a bit like London, where uh, on a given day, I think uh, somebody's picture is taken like 200 times or so, uh, because there are cameras everywhere. So based on that same logic, uh, Dubai has been uh, reassuring uh, foreign governments as well as some international organization like the, uh, the uh, FATF and other organizations that are uh, concerned about matters of money laundering and terrorist financing, et cetera. So Dubai has been very re reassuring, saying that we know what's going on, we're monitoring all that, and we're trying to prevent abuses. Now this is where uh, the problem with the lack of democracy uh, can be a factor. I think had there been a bit more democracy in Dubai, then the press would have been uh, more forthcoming about these kinds of stories. Now what you have, if you look at the, uh, the official discourse and the official statements by, uh, by the Dubai government, is you have a sense of corporate PR in that uh, they're always, uh, they, they've become very good at uh, issuing statements uh, that reassure everybody, uh, whereas not much is, is done. Now, uh, one example of this kind of corporate PR aspect of what's going on in Dubai, that there was a World Economic Forum meeting in, uh, in Dubai, uh, I think it was in, in early November or so, uh, just two or three weeks before uh, Dubai uh, really encountered its big financial crisis. And throughout that meeting, the big question was, uh, uh, what about the Dubai debt? And, uh, and the official response by all the, the officials who went to that, uh, to, to that meeting was basically that uh, the worst is behind us, that is, we've resolved the crisis, which is almost identical to what banks have been saying in the US for the last two, three years. That is, it's, it's all over, we've dealt with that. So it is a very real problem, and I'm not sure the government is equipped to really deal with, with that. That is, this is where the absence of democracy uh, is, uh, is really a factor. Just wanted, can I add something? Just wanted to add uh, one thing to that. I, I, you could even suggest that Ibrahim add that to his, his list of contradictions about Dubai because part of the appeal of Dubai always was, in, in addition to be an entrepreneur center, was also that it was serving as a sort of center for attracting money from a lot of these states that were more closed states. If you look at Iran, if you look at you know Russia to some extent, even African states, it was trying to show we're kind of welcome to this sort of element and, and it was playing a bit on the, the looseness of the system. But of course then when it has ambitions to be a real financial center, then you've got some needs to have solid regulations that people feel you know they can turn to. And it was interesting that when they did the International Financial Center, then of course that they just adopted wholesale sort of the regulations straight from London, you know, trying to say that no, we really have this under control. And I think kind of the the rise of Dubai as a financial center it was definitely you know it was built on sort of shaky ground in the sense of these these contradictions of the two different appeals that it wanted to make. And I know that it was just because I spent a lot of time in Bahrain, it was really not uh, well received by Bahrain, who, who had spent so much time really making their reputation on the fact that the, you know, the, the regulators there were really solid and that they had a good control over things in Bahrain. And so to see the rise of Dubai was sort of demoralizing, I guess. Professor Norton. Thank you very much. Um, two questions for Professor Habibi. I wonder if uh, <clears throat> your data <clears throat> permits you to disaggregate between conventional banking institutions and Islamic banking institutions in terms of their investment uh, preferences. And, uh, <clears throat> and to what extent, uh, and to what extent uh, um, that data would suggest uh, perhaps a preference for uh, investing in, in China or India as opposed to Europe or the U.S. And for each of the panelists, I wonder to what extent this category that uh, Kristen Diwan uh, suggested, um, borrowing I think from the Kuwait National Bank survey, uh, of new Islamics uh, has some kind of socio-cultural coherence to it. 
In other words, how would you describe these new Islamics? How do their values differ from, um, from the sort of residual category? And uh, what evidence do you have to suggest that this is a, a useful category? And for Ibrahim as well, please. Very well. Um, uh, the pattern of investment by Islamic banks in uh, Asian countries, uh, and even some in Europe, shows that uh, the, uh, as long as they are, they are assured that the, the, the subject of investment, the project um, that they are considering, meets the Islamic requirements, is not involved with alcoholism or prostitution or anything like that, um, then they are not sensitive to, to the um, location of the investment. Islamic banks are investing in Europe. Uh, Islamic banks, in partnership with uh, some uh, banks in uh, Malaysia or in Singapore, are, in, in, are investing throughout Asia. They are not limited to Islamic countries in particular. And um, aside from um, requiring that uh, Islamic criteria, they seem to be operating almost similar to professional, conventional banks. And that's why some major banks um, like uh, Citigroup and the European banks are eager to establish um, sort of <coughs> Islamic investment branches so that they can tap into the, um, the wealth of um, wealthy conservative Muslims in the region. Uh, so um, I, the, the evidence does not show a significant difference in terms of patterns of investment. But of course, they need to write the contract in such a way that it is a equity contract rather than a loan based on interest, which is not that difficult. There are many devices for that available. Thank you. Would you like to comment? On sure. That? Um, just a comment about the the modern Islamics, and I, it's something I've thought about a lot. And um, I, I think it's interesting. I mean, it, it's something that I think comes about, uh, obviously, from this interaction of the importation of a lot of kind of uh, institutions that had Western orientations, but then that were adapted to the, to the local environment. Um, and if you think about it, I mean, if you, you said, how do you distinguish them from sort of traditional people or people that were there before, how people would have thought about it before? I mean, what, what would people do before you had Islamic banks? I mean, if you were a pious Muslim before, you know, Islamic banks didn't exist before the 1970s in the region, you didn't really have a choice. If you wanted to, you know, go with the bank and put deposits and get interest on that. You had to go to conventional banks, or you could leave your money out, or you could just not get interest on it. Once Islamic banks succeed in sort of creating this new hybrid mix, which had to be created, I mean, it had to be adapted from sort of traditions that had existed, but put into a form that kind of could compete with contemporary banks, then you have a place, of course, where pious Muslims can put their money and feel better about it. But I think it also poses a challenge to other people in the society because then they have to make a choice, which wasn't there before. I mean, maybe they weren't so comfortable with it, but they were putting their money in conventional banks. Now they have to sit there and think about it. And, th and this is basically putting a new category into a field where it wasn't there before. So now when you're looking at banking, you have to think about, well, is it important to me? I mean, is, is something about my beliefs going to play a factor in whether I put my money in this bank or not? How much is this going to be relevant to the way that I'm living my life? And I think to the extent that the um, Islamic movements, and particularly Muslim Brotherhood-inspired movements, were able to create these adaptations, it was a challenge to everybody in society to think about how much to pull that into their lives. And I think that modern Islamic category and the way they described it to me, the, the kind of questions they were asking and that they could see kind of people, I mean, the woman who had done the polling said, it's kind of interesting, you can see people kind of trying these things, like testing it out, like, well, does this feel right? Does it not? See people shifting back and forth between that conservative category to the modern Islamic category and, and the questions they could see it. I think that's basically just speaks to sort of the success of the institutionalization of these kind of hybrid institutions and that they were able to communicate what it's like to be a modern Muslim living in these societies. Uh, the, the, the only thing I, I would add to what uh, Kristen just mentioned is that from a kind of national security perspective, like seen from Washington, uh, a number of distinctions have been discussed and thought about in terms of trying to separate uh, those people who live their faith uh, kind of at, at, at every level, including the economic level, and people who constitute a potential security threat in terms of people who might become uh, terrorists. So a lot of the interesting stuff, and uh, Kristen mentioned before uh, Vali Nasra's uh, recent book, uh, 
on that subject, which is quite interesting in terms of saying, well, you can see a rise of Islamism uh, that is more economically driven than, uh, th than political in terms of having grievances and uh, having the potential of ending in, te in terrorism. Yes. I'm probably the only one who's not a political sciences or uh, economics person, so I apologize for the fundamental basicness of my question, but this is addressed to us, Dr. Devan. If it is, as sort of based on what you said, fundamentally difficult right now, and we've looked at two or three models that you said to define the middle class, and if we assume that a lot of our politics, you know, sort of the political approach of the United States and Europe is based on the idea that People are going to get educated, get into the middle class. We saw this in Iran, you know, and they're going to rise above a level, and therefore they're going to follow this policy. And the whole thing misfires or backfires because they don't behave the way it's predicted. Could that be, or do you think that it's a contributor to the tensions is sort of the political understanding? We're fundamentally sort of calculating a path or, or sort of designing a path in the West where it's not crossing at all the reality of the other direction. Interesting question. I mean, I, I think, I mean, I, I see it, and of course I'm a political scientist, so I like to think in terms of categories, but I think it's kind of a, a misplaced faith in the ability to, to separate these things in, in a way. <laughs> I mean, like we like to think of economics as a sort of clean, and you can kind of take this out, and it's free from all of these other sort of commitments and things like that. But, you know, ultimately these things, I mean, and I think the rise of Islamic banks are a good example. I mean, they came about I mean, there's some strategic element to it, right? And I, you know, I have identified sort of Islamic movements were involved in some degree to the creation of these banks, but it also came about very naturally from the sort of demand and the way that people wanted to express themselves. So I, I think this sort of looking for this kind of category of people that are going to rise, I think you can see the economic interests and how they're going to play out. But I think those economic interests don't necessarily tack necessarily to a certain political worldview. And I think that's the mistake that we make a lot. We think if there's a rising middle class, then it's going to be modern. It's going to approach the world the way that we do. And it's going to have the same political interests that we do. It's going to communicate itself in some modern way. And I think you can see there's a separation between that. There's economic interests and in how people follow their economic interests. But there's also a, a way that they communicate that. And, and I think people have been very inventive. And you can see it with the Islamic economics. You can see it in the way that other cleavages, like I talked about the tribal cleavage is becoming much more important right now, how that still stays attached in a strong way to these things. And so that it's not, we tend to think that all these things go together and, and they don't. So. Uh, yes, please. My question is uh, from any of the panelists and it may have a um, longer time horizon uh, than the discussion we had already. Uh, however, uh, how do you think uh, the current uh, movement toward the uh, lower carbon uh, future will affect uh, oil exporters in especially Middle Eastern countries? Or in other words, uh, what are the probable responses from oil exporters in reaction to uh, climate change debates or uh, or what are their paths forwards for oil, ex oil exporters after Copenhagen? Uh, would you like me to, I think, Professor Bade could also contribute. The projections for demand for oil uh, do not show that, uh, at least the ones that are done by um, formal institutions, such, such as US Department of Energy, do not predict a decline in demand for oil. Um, uh, the, at, at the very best, uh, the uh, steps taken to uh, prevent climate change can contribute to a, a slower growth in demand for oil. But the demand will, will continue um, for a considerable future. Uh, the Middle Eastern countries could be divided into those who have a limited supply of oil and those who have a large supply, such as Saudi Arabia, in terms of oil and uh, Qatar, with regard to natural gas, who have a longer horizon uh, and uh, um, think of the next 50 to 100 years, perhaps, in terms of their supply. I think in either way, um, the demand will still be there for uh, for considerable future. Uh, I don't think it's possible to imagine a time when um, 
the demand for oil declines before these countries run out of oil. It could slow down a little bit because of the steps for global um, um, climate change. At least that's my uh, comment. Please yeah, let, let me just add uh, one thing, which is that in the Emirates and elsewhere in the Gulf, there's been a lot of talk about clean energy and uh, kind of uh, preoccupation with the environment in general. Now, I don't know how much of that is um, wishful thinking, or if you're a cynic, you might say it's kind of uh, good PR, uh, and how much of it is, uh, is, is authentic. Uh, the one thing I think one should think about is that many of these uh, promises of uh, getting serious about the environment and, uh, and going along with these kinds of uh, objectives happened at a time of uh, great uh, prosperity. So it was before the recent crisis. And what often happens is that these kinds, this kind, kind of these kinds of very ambitious projects that can be self-defeating if you look at your short-term uh, self-interest, uh, very often, uh, when um, uh, kind of when you get into bad economic times, uh, these kinds of uh, ambitious uh, and idealistic goals can fall by the wayside. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, right there. Yeah. Um, I have a question uh, for for Dr. Diwan, but uh, others as well. And I guess I'm interested in investment in education, and particularly of the middle class, uh, as kind of you brought it up. But there's uh, a lot of programming going on around uh, uh, education, bringing in um, kind of foreign universities, but also uh, reinvesting in kind of some, some local ones. So what can you say about that as social, political, but also economic uh, uh, phenomenon happening in the Gulf? Yeah, um, I think somebody's going to be speaking about education later, yeah. so they'll get to say a lot more about it. But just uh, it is uh, w one thing that you've seen. Obviously, you have seen, as you mentioned, this rise of the importation or, or, or the attraction of a lot of um, American universities and European universities to the Gulf, and it's a, a huge phenomenon and um, impacts probably a lot of us. Um, but the other thing you have too is just the rise of private universities, and I, I think this actually plays into the whole. Uh, problem of sort of the de decline or, or the, the waning rentier state in a way, you know, that you see it in a lot of these states that the public sector has been sort of, or public services have been declining. Um, and so education hasn't gotten the attention that it should have gotten in a lot of these places. And a lot of the um, classes, especially classes that were able to bring in a lot more resources and money and stuff through the private sector weren't happy with these schools. And so you see the rise of a lot of private universities um, in these states that these people can then go to. But I think that just amplifies these kind of cleavages that we start to see because people that are dependent and have the income that are dependent on the public sector then don't have the same opportunities that those that are able to go out to the and take advantage of these private universities. That doesn't hold true everywhere. I mean, you can see like Qatar has a very interesting experiment where they're basically remaking their entire educational system from the ground up from primary school through a plan that was, as far as I know, designed by RAND. I mean, which is pretty fascinating. I, I find it unbelievable, actually, that they're able to do that. Um, so there's differences across the state, but I think the, some of these public-private things are play out in education as well. Professor Kazemi. Uh, if I may ask another question. Uh, this is actually directed to Kristen, but any of the other two colleagues, uh, please contribute to that. This is about the middle class. Mm -hmm. And you know, traditionally, we the social scientists, historians, look upon the Middle East in terms of middle class as a division between property middle class mm -hmm. and salary middle class. And of course, Manfred Halpern's book dealt with that, and now Vali Nasser's book. But the question for you, uh, is the bigger question for me at least, is that division between the property and salary middle class disappearing? Mm -hmm. Are the lines being blurred? The two of them are in some ways fusing, mm -hmm. or, or the classical model is still correct? Well, I think if you look at just sort of empirically what's happening, it, it may be. I mean, I think the evolution has been, and a lot of the distinctions, I mean, the whole distinction between the categories that we use instead of middle class or something was the, the merchant class, right? And the people that had capital early on and were able then to make investments and, and do things in the private sector in some of these states and um, 
as opposed to those who came late to the Rentier system. And a lot of this is derived from looking at the Rentier system and the way it functioned, right? So you had a certain class that was a little bit freed from the Rentier system in the sense that they were able to play in the, the private sector. And then you have, again, a class that's more dependent, that's getting their income from salaries and directly from the state. I think in that same survey that um, I mentioned, and again, I haven't been able to see the details of these numbers. Um, it is it was interesting, though, that if you look at some of these states, and I think Saudi Arabia was pointed out um, in particular, I mean, even though people have these salary jobs, a lot of people aren't, you know, they have second businesses, right? So they have something going on in the, in the private sector as well. So I think there is some of that mix going on, and it would be really interesting then to see how much that plays into it and how that, that is able to, to go across these, these cleavages. So I think it's still useful to keep that, that categorization and just then look at it within the social historical evolution of kind of the Rantier state and see where it, it fits in. Um, I think I should mention some of you may know Giacomo Luciani, who's done a lot of political economy. I think right now they have a, a big project where they're going to be looking at the role of the private sector and, and political change and things like that. So I'm, I'm really eager to see some of the research that's coming out on the ground that can kind of look at this more closely. So. Uh, yes, right there. Uh, my Please. question is for Dr. Habibi. Um, you hinted, at, you hinted at the idea that investment in non-Western countries, such as China or India, could be coming from a disgruntledness or frustration with the lack of resolving the Arab-Israeli conflict. Um, and I guess I'm just wondering to what degree you found people, or believe people maybe sort of consciously and reflexively disinvesting or divesting from one area and investing in another area coming from this sense of disgruntledness, or if there are other spaces for economic action where that frustration might be expressed? Uh, well, for the, in private sector, the primary motive is economics. And the only way this um, political factor will work through their uh, decisions is that they might fear that uh, the r relations between GCC and Western countries might be stable in the future, and just as Professor Verde mentioned, that their investments in these countries might be subject to some kind of uh, political restrictions. Uh, the reorientation of trade and economic relations towards Asia um, has taken place at the government level, meaning that it's the uh, GCC governments that have shown the initial interest in really uh, expanding the or creating the framework for improved uh, economic ties. So, um, for example, we see an increase in the number of uh, state visits. And there were a couple of times when the finance ministers or the foreign ministers of all GC countries together traveled to China or to another Asian country as a group. That's really an interesting phenomenon of coordinated uh, foreign policy management to, to show that, that um, collective interest in improvement of relationships. So th those political factors affect the government decisions, in my view. Uh, for the private sector, it's primarily economic motives that uh, might create it. And then another element for the private sector is that in some of these Asian countries, you have some Muslim populations or some Muslim institutions that have closer contact with the uh, uh, equivalent Muslim institutions in GCC countries, which again encourages uh, better relationships. If I may, add, uh, sorry, if I just may add something. Uh, one episode we haven't uh, mentioned, and that is part of this whole decision uh, about where to invest in the uh, Dubai ports incident that you probably all remember, uh, which I think also left a, a bad taste uh, among uh, major investors in the Middle East. And another uh, related uh, phenomenon is uh, the preoccupation with sovereign wealth funds especially those coming uh, from the Gulf. So every time uh, something like that happens, uh, you keep hearing on the part of uh, Middle Eastern officials and uh, business people uh, the sense that, uh, well, uh, they want our money, but uh, on their own terms. Whereas when Middle Easterners are dealing with other parts of the world, there is less of that feeling. So that should be added to political and other grievances. Professor Samati. Um, uh, this question is directed to Dr. Duan, um, even though uh, others could take a stab at it, especially Dr. Ben Azizi as well. Um, um, in my field of study, uh, away from economics and political science, we used to have this literature on modernization, mm -hmm. 
and uh, out of that uh, came questions of culture and participatory you know um, development and uh, as of late we also have uh, multiple modernities and alternative modernities mm -hmm. so with this, this question of middle class um, you did a very good job of mapping out some of this you know uh, literature um, I was wondering if we can map you know if, if you <coughs> have done this in your writing about the rise of the middle class in terms of that literature on multiple modernities. Yeah, I'm, I'm not as familiar with that. I always had some friends that were working a lot in uh, alternative modernities, and I always thought that this would be a very good example of that in a way. But I'm, I'm really, I'm not actually well versed enough in the literature, I think, to kind of make all the connections that you're probably hoping to see. If you, if you know yourself, if you, if you can expand it, it might be interesting to hear how you, how you would see it. Um, well, um, <clears throat> Excuse me. As you know, uh, in my field, mm -hmm. uh, the question of um, representation and culture, mm -hmm. um, and um, um, some of the ca categories that we used to have in modernization literature. Um, for example, these days we talk about hybridity. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't used to have that. You know, we have creative. Uh, you know, um, adoption. Um, so what was used to be uh, top down, I mean bottom up, bottom down, you know, top down or now, uh, then at, uh, after a while it was bottom up. Mm -hmm. Now there seems to be a middle ground uh, yeah. where we can talk about values, um, ideologies, and, and uh, still avoid categories of tradition right. and modernity at the same time. Yeah. I, I think one, I mean, uh, one thing that I always try to do, because there's a lot of discussion about sort of, you know, um, some of the literature really sees as a very natural process, kind of this kind of hybridity that, that comes about through sort of playing with these different things. But I, probably just my predisposition as a political scientist, I always like to keep some element of power and see sort of how that's coursing through things. Um, and so, I, I mean, one thing that you see with the rise of Islamic finance and its ability to take root, just to use that as the example that we have here, I mean, it really came about through a, a structural shift. I mean, Islamic finance was out there. I don't want to say that it wasn't. I mean, we had experiments in, in Pakistan and in, in Egypt as well in different places. But you didn't see it becoming as big until you have the oil boom in the 70s, which brought all of this money to this pious population and made this market possible. So there's still a link to the structural which makes, you know, I'm always a little more comfortable if I can link it back to structural things instead of just playing out there where a lot of these other literatures play. But that's just my own disposition. One last question. Yes, please. Stephanie Watts, Boston University, and I'm a layperson in this area. But I'm interested, I guess, Professor Dewan, but anyone that would want to address this, um, perspectives on these trends the tribalism and the rising middle class for the women's status and mm. economic power and education. Yeah, that, that's a that's a really interesting and very important question. And I, I actually I haven't done the research. So I'm not I'm not sure where that's going. I mean, if you look in Kuwait, for instance, I mean, at the same time you have these trends, of course. In the last, uh, you've had this great increase in in, in women's political rights. Um, Kuwaiti women were finally given the right to vote, and in the last parliamentary elections, you actually had four women voted to the, the parliament. At one time, it's a parliament of 50, 50 members, and this was the first time they'd been elected, so it was quite significant and a big breakthrough. Um, all of the women that were elected were from the more urban districts. You know, you can kind of identify by districts. But one thing that was interesting, you did have a woman that ran in one of the tribal districts, uh, Zikr Rashidi, who did extremely well. I mean, she, she came, you get from each district, you take 10 people, and she was, you know, she was well up there. She was actually pretty close, and people were amazed by this, that she could run in a tribal district and get support. Um, and if you parallel it, and I don't know if it works out, because you'd have to do actually the research about the tribal attitudes and this sort of thing. I mean, if you look at the I Islamic movements in particular, um, not the Shia movements, which actually took a different attitude, but the Sunni movements um, were opposed to the woman's right to vote. But as soon as they were given the right to vote, they organized very quickly and had, for instance, you know, the Hadas party, which is a Muslim Brotherhood party, had a whole other branch set up for women to kind of become active and in, in, not in running, but in, in supporting candidates and kind of mobilizing women. Um, I don't know if that same thing would happen on the tribal level. And just from my understanding of it, it is a much bigger barrier, um, and I'm just talking on the, on the level of uh, 
politics. And a lot of the women that I've spoken to, the thing is that the, the the education levels are going up, so the education levels are there, but there seems to be barriers in, in other other areas. So. Would you uh, would you like to comment? Just, just a brief comment that uh, there seems to be also some progress in terms of uh, mm -hmm. the range of economic activities in which women can be can participate, and um, for example, in Saudi Arabia we see um, some. Uh, uh, I think the head of the. Uh, Jadis uh, Chamber of Commerce is a woman, and women are very active in um, in uh, economic activities. And also, uh, with all the criticism of Dubai, the fact that citizens of GCC can easily travel among each other has created an opportunity for Saudi women to go to Dubai to work. For example, some t educated Saudi women who cannot work in Saudi Arabia are working in in Dubai. And Bahrain, too. And, and Bahrain. So that um, freedom of movement has, in freedom of movement for the labor force, has created some opportunities for those uh, who are more progressive to um, seek opportunities elsewhere. Okay, I have one point to that. I, I just remembered a paper that was written by a, a colleague of mine um, at American University, John Willoughby, who's an economist, um, looking at segmentations of the labor market by, uh, in terms of gender. And it is sort of interesting because it, it maps actually onto this whole idea of, of class. And, and what he saw happening from the research that he did in um, Saudi Arabia is that, in fact, you do see a lot of women, upper class women, moving a lot into, into working. Um, and, and, and numbers are very, I mean, in some countries, the Kuwait women, I think 60% of women work in Kuwait. So you have huge numbers in some countries. In Saudi Arabia, the interesting th thing that he identified, though, is that there are certain segments of the market that are more open to women. And so the kind of upper class jobs that you could do, and it still tends to be gender segregated, but there, there are uh, m opportunities for women to move into those. However, if you look at the, the lower level jobs, lower education and lower economic uh, if you look at economic terms jobs, it's much harder for women to go into those for, for social reasons, um, the kind of work that you would look at as sort of working class jobs. So the interesting thing you may have over time, what he argues in this paper, is that there are much more opportunities for a certain class of women than others, and that might actually affect the way the power and the dynamics of sort of the way women's um, issues play out in the country. Uh, would you join me in thanking our three panelists for their excellent papers and the members of the audience who posed all those um, really excellent questions. Thank you so much.